Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Who told somebody about Jesus this week? All right, Ron. Yesterday, uh, not the Douglasville, on Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Douglasville, the waitress, the waitress had a need and we prayed for her right there and she started bawling. Oh, wow. Well. So just being you know, be a witness. Yep. Be a witness. That's right. Somebody else, tell somebody about Jesus this week. Yes, sir. I had a lively conversation with some of the people that I bowl with. Of course, I bowl four different times, so different groups. Well, one lady in particular, uh, let me say a prayer of protection over her. She and her parents just uh, left to go to Africa for three weeks. Okay, so tourist. you were able to pray for like pray for them. All right. It's a tourist thing, but uh, uh, they're good people, and I asked the Lord to please give them travel mercies there and back. And she said something about tigers, and I said, "Don't get too close." She said, "Well, they're just cubs." <laughs> said, well, okay. Okay. All right. Somebody else, tell somebody about Jesus. Apparently it's a little warm in here. That may be why I'm sweating. <clears throat> okay. There's nothing we can do about it, by the way. Uh, okay. Uh, who's on time reading your Bible through this week? Okay, way to go. Way to go. All right. Uh, this week you should have found the answers to these three trivia questions. <clears throat> uh, the first one, David twice spared the life of a man who was trying to kill him. Whose life did David spare? Saul. Saul, yeah. Uh, and then the follow-up question, how did King Saul die? Fell on, Fell on his own sword, yeah. Uh, then in the New Testament, who said the following? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus, Jesus said that, yes. <clears throat> we are uh, studying a passage of Scripture this morning that is very, very special. Uh, it's very special for a lot of reasons. <clears throat> One, it is, uh, it's a letter of Paul's that he addresses to an individual. He wrote a lot of letters to churches. <clears throat> and uh, this one is to an individual. We're in 2 Timothy, by the way. Uh, but he also wrote letters to others like uh, 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 Titus and, and uh, oh good grief, uh, Philemon. And uh, that's not what makes it particularly uh, special. What makes it very, very special is it was written in the year 66 AD. And in this letter, Paul says that the time of my departure is at hand. Now you'll remember if you know your Bible that in the book of Acts we read that Paul was uh, imprisoned and he was sent to Rome because he appealed to Caesar. So he was sent to Rome. He was in prison there, but he was released after a while. But the crazy man in charge had him arrested again, uh, Nero. He was both crazy and corrupt. And so Paul is, is languishing in uh, a prison that is basically a large hole in the ground at the Mamertine uh, prison there in Rome. And he, is, uh, he knows that his time is running out, that he's about to leave this world. This letter, 2 Timothy, is his swan song. It is, uh, you, if you're about to die, your perspective on life and what's important is going to have laser focus. If you've, ever, if you've ever been at the side 
of Christians as they get near to their home going. Uh, there's something special about that. And there is something inspired about their words. Paul knows his time is short. And he was beheaded the same year that he wrote this. Um, so we're going to study the first and, and, and a little bit of the second chapter of Second Timothy today. And I want you to uh, give it special consideration from that perspective that uh, Paul knows he's about to be killed and he knows that he's uh, passing on his legacy to Timothy in the best way he can. And I, I suppose he also knows that this letter is going to be read uh, by many others. He might not have realized it was going to be read by multiplied millions of people. But uh, he certainly knew that Timothy was going to read it and Timothy was likely to share it with his church and the other churches around him. So let's pick up with uh, verse 8 of Second Timothy chapter 1 where it says... Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard until the day what has been entrusted to me. So he begins with a, with a therefore, and I, I have to go back and, and share with you what the therefore is about, and it's in verse 7, where he's talking about, uh, uh, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and love, and of a sound mind. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Because he's done, if you're a Christian today and you know Jesus, he's done something very special in you. He has put in you the spirit of, or, or not the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And that's why we can not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. If you watch the news, does, does the news broadcast cause you to be more confident in the work of God? Or does it incite fear? Anxiety, yeah. Uh, that's why I quit watching the news years ago. Uh, I can't. I can't take it. I just. I just can't. Uh, so let's uh, uh, let's be aware that God is in control. Amen. He really is. He really is, and it may be a part of His purpose to allow the church. To be persecuted here. We are on the precipice of that happening. And that train is barreling down the tracks. Incrementally, we should expect to lose some of our freedoms. Okay? Now, that's not bad news. 
because the church flourishes in times of persecution. Are you interested in the church flourishing? Okay. Well, one of the tools that God uses to expand the church and to strengthen the church is persecution. Uh, the church in America has gotten to be fat, dumb, and happy. Uh, we've enjoyed great freedom and liberty. Uh, but it may be time that God has uh, determined that we need to be strong. That we need to be strong. Uh, we don't get strong by being fat, dumb, or, and, and happy. Okay? We get strong when we have to work. We get strong when we have to flex our muscles. And the same is true in our spiritual life. When we have to flex our spiritual muscles. This letter was written in a time when Nero was covering Christians in tar and putting them on a cross in the arena, setting them afire for the lighting of the games where the Christians were thrown to the lions. That's what was going on when this uh, letter was written. Nero was the one that wanted to build a beautiful new section of town. So it is pretty well assumed that he started a fire in Rome that burned about half of the city. So he could do his redevelopment of the area. It's a crazy guy. You know, you, you hear Ro, uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Uh, he was not a nice guy. And Paul is about to die. But he's not ashamed. And he's encouraging Timothy, don't be ashamed. He's encouraging every one of us, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. The freedom of speech that we've enjoyed for so long is under assault and if you disagree with certain contingents of our population, you're shut down. Uh, and that would include the Christian perspective. So it's, it's likely to get a lot worse in, in the coming days. So don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoners, but uh, as prisoner, but share in suffering. We as Christians have not suffered for our faith, most of us. Uh, not like the Chinese do, not like the Christians in Hindu uh, cultures, not like the Christians in Muslim <coughs> cultures. We've not really suffered like that, but we might. And when we do, don't be ashamed of it. Wear it as a red badge of honor when it happens. Uh, don't be, a, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling. What is your calling? It's a holy calling. Your calling is to be the best example or best representative of Jesus in this world that you can be. You are an image bearer. You bear the image of Christ Jesus. And I pray every day that we would be drawn so close to Jesus that other people would see Jesus in us and be drawn to him. That's, that's our calling. It's not necessarily what we do. Our calling is to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. That's our calling. Now, it's expressed in a lot of things that we do, but our calling is to love God and love each other. 
And God has given us the power to do it. Uh, and it's a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace. Do you know the purpose of God in every situation? Not necessarily. Do you know the heart of God? Hmm? I think, I think we do know the heart of You know the Word? You know the heart of God. You know the heart of God. Uh, and uh, not uh, our, we have a holy calling and it is because of His purpose and His grace and His purpose was to give us Jesus. Uh, it was Jesus' purpose to die on the cross for us, to be resurrected and sit at the right hand of the Father and that's what he's been doing for 2,000 years, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and me. If you want to know what that looks like, read John chapter 17. And you'll get a glimpse of the work that Jesus has been doing for the last 2,000 years, talking to the Father about us, interceding to the Father for us. Uh, and by the way, if you're if you're tuning in by Facebook Live, thank you. Uh, drop us a note to say that you're watching, and it'll it'll encourage us and others. So, the holy calling has to do with God's own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. I know this this is hard to wrap your head around but God chose you God chose me before the world began I don't understand that I really don't uh, but Jesus died in the mind of God before the world was ever made and uh, he chose us in him and now that uh, in the appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he says, who abolished death. Wait a minute. He's saying that Jesus abolished death. What on earth does he mean by that? Forever death. Folks still die, don't they? Forever death, yeah. He abolished forever death. Uh, or for those who come to know Jesus, His life is in us. That life is eternal life and we already have it. We already have it. We are body, mind, and spirit. Uh, body, soul, and spirit. And that part of us, other than the body, is going to live forever. We're already alive. But what about lost people? What about lost people? People that don't know Jesus. They're dead already. They are dead already and need to be resurrected to life through faith in Christ. Oh, if we just had compassion or our compassion was fueled by an understanding of how desperate their situation really is. I think we would be more motivated to reach out to people with the gospel. But he abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You, my friends, are immortal. You have the life of God in you and you will never die. Your body will. Your body's going to, going to fade away. And for some of us, it's fading faster than others. Your body's going to fade away. But you, the essence of you, you are immortal. You will never die. Um, so, we have immortality through the gospel. 
for which I was appointed a preacher, apostle, and teacher. Uh, now, I don't know why Paul is, is, is making this statement in this letter to Timothy other than to tell other people that we're going to read this later on that he was a teacher, a preacher, and an apostle because Timothy already knew all of that about Paul. But for those people that would read this and might not know all of that about Paul, if this was the only gospel that they ever got or the only uh, fragment of the scriptures that they ever read, they might want to know who is this guy that's saying these things. Preacher, apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. He's a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, and that is the reason he's suffering. He's a leader in the church. We have some godly leaders in this church, and I praise God for that. We have some men and women who uh, are faithful servants of God, faithful people of God. Uh, but he suffers because he's a preacher, apostle, and teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm not ashamed, he says. I'm not ashamed. Now, remember, he's, he's in a prison. He's facing beheading in a few days or weeks. But he's not ashamed. He's going with his head held high. Uh, for I know. What does he know? According to this passage. He knows his Redeemer lives. What else does he know? Verse 12. I know whom I have believed. Not in whom he's believed. He knows who he has believed. Who is that? He's believed Jesus. I know whom I have believed and I am convinced. Why? Because of his interaction with the Spirit of God. Because of his teaching of the gospel. Uh, his teaching of the Old Testament that taught him about Jesus. I know whom I have believed. By the way, he knows who he believed because he met him face to face one day. On the road to Damascus, he met Jesus. So he knows who he has believed uh, and is convinced that he is able, Jesus is able, to guard unto that day what has been entrusted to me. What was entrusted to him? The gospel of Jesus Christ. What has been entrusted to you? The gospel of Jesus Christ. So, this could be our prayer. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Let's grab hold of that. God has entrusted to you the message of the gift of life, immortality. Wow! <laughs> you have that gift. Let's not hoard it. Let's share it. It goes back to what you said at the beginning of the class. Who shared someone about Jesus? Who told somebody about That's Jesus? About. Just sharing that gospel. Sharing the gospel. We need to do that. He'll give you the power of the words to say. And I know this. When I first got saved and went to somebody, what did he get saved? Bless me. That's the Holy Spirit's job. That is the Holy Spirit's job. And be obedient and let them know the love of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. All right. Passage number 2, we move to the 13th verse. Uh, and this is a short one, the 13th and the 14th verse of 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
Follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Pattern. Paul says that he's a pattern saint. Could we say that about ourselves? That we are pattern saints and young Christian, you ought to look at our life and use that as a pattern for your mode of living. Ouch. Hmm. Follow the pattern. Now what we can say is to follow the pattern of the sound words. Okay? Now we tell people about Jesus. We teach uh, Bible studies. We, we uh, uh, share our thoughts on the Scripture with other people. Are they sound words? I would gather... In most part, yeah, they, they probably are. Uh, so if, if you were to teach somebody to follow the pattern of the things that I say when I share the gospel, you'll do well. And, and frankly, this gospel has been entrusted to us to take it and grow the church. Because if we don't share it, how are people going to come to know Jesus? It's not just for one person to share the gospel at 11 o'clock once a week. This gospel has to be taken into the workplace, into the community, into the social gathering. We've got to be telling people about Jesus because they might miss immortality if they don't hear it. From us. Um, so follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me. I think we could all sign up for that, that folks would do well to listen to our theology about the gospel. In the faith, the words You've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Uh, here's another thing. He's saying, do it in love. Do it in love. The gospel message that says, turn or you're going to burn. <laughs> Makes me cringe. But when you love somebody and they know you love them, They're more apt to listen to what you have to say. So we share it with love. We used to have a guy here, some of you remember him, Bob the Doula. Amen, Bob. He'd get on the street corners and hire him and preach on the street corners. Everybody knew. He loved Jesus. And I mean, he was catching. He was yeah. sitting anywhere. And that's, that's what it's all about. It's about Jesus. Yeah. I was listening to a show the other day. Chain, which is Bill Robinson, and uh, he was talking, you know, all through the book of Acts, they don't talk about a specific sin, all they talk about is love and the power of Jesus. And you know, at no point does you know they start talking about sin until you get on down to once you become a Christian. Mm -hmm. So, we should never be beating somebody up over their sin, we should be beating them up with love. You bring up a good point. When a heathen acts like a heathen, <clears throat> don't get upset. They're just doing what they, their nature has them to do. Can you love them even when they act like a heathen? We have to. <clears throat> we have to love them even if they are doing some things that we think are abominations before God. we got to love them. Because if you don't love people, you can't win them. 
Love has to come yes, first. We do. Yeah, we have. And how do we do it? Verse 14. How do we love people and share the gospel with them? Well, it's by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. That's how we do it. You have the, the Spirit of God living in you. Uh, so we let Him guard the good deposit entrusted to us. That what is that deposit He's talking about? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit I, I think the Holy Spirit's going to guard it, whatever it is, the deposit. But He's been talking about the gospel. The gospel message has been deposited. Normally, <clears throat> with a bank account, if you put some money in, what happens to the money that you've deposited? It well, you want it to grow. But what do you normally do if you deposit it in your checking account? <laughs> you spend it. You write checks on it. The gospel has been deposited in you. Are you writing checks against it? Is it going out to meet needs of others? <clears throat> okay. Um, this is why last week when me and Lady was at Kmart, uh -huh. there was this um, junior who Mm -hmm. There you go. You're sending the gospel to Africa. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. You sent me a message this week about Rwanda. Uh, starting to see our there. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to higher up. And we've got two churches trying to start to see our in Africa. In Rwanda. Yep. Yep. Wow. Uh, all right. Let, let's wrap this up. <clears throat> Part three. Uh, we're moving on to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'm sorry. Oh, the fill-ins. <clears throat> the fill-ins. Of course the fill-ins. Um, was that? That one's on section 2. Okay, the fill-in. Uh, on your page 86 in your study guide, uh, edification takes place through the fellowship Christians share with one another. And the church is preaching and teaching of Scripture, helping people understand and internalize the whole counsel of God. Edification is building up the body of Christ, equipping people to live on mission for the kingdom of God. So your three fill-in words are fellowship, Scripture, equipping. Thank you, Ron, for that. We also have one at, uh, in the next section too. So let's move on to section three where we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse 1. Uh, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim uh, to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So, you then, my child, Paul was Timothy's spiritual father. It is uh, uh, assumed that in his either his first or second uh, missionary journey to the, to the city where Timothy lived, that uh, Timothy came to know Jesus. Uh, the, his grandmother and his mother were both Christians, Lois and Eunice. And he has a great heritage there of Christian family members who poured into him. Uh, so then, my child, now Paul has been pouring into him as well. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What is grace? God's redemption in 
Mm -hmm. uh, getting something you don't deserve, God's riches at Christ's expense, uh, great, great uh, uh, definitions. Be strengthened by the grace. We're getting grace, but we don't deserve it. We know that. Uh, also, as we receive grace, <clears throat> can I say it? We should give grace the same way to people that don't deserve it. Hmm? Woo, got quiet all of a sudden. <clears throat> The gossip of the gospel, yes. <laughs> carry on, carry on. All right. Uh, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Our calling, love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love each other as ourselves. And then in, in the, one of the ways we express that love to others is to make disciples. That's a part of the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. I might add that when we're making disciples, we're making disciple makers. So that the gospel won't fizzle out. The gospel will be carried on and on and on. How do you make a disciple? You spend time with them. You build a structure of spending time with this person. In CR, we call it a sponsor, where the sponsor pours their life into this person for up to a year or more. I've, I've seen some that have lasted decades that relationship, uh, making disciples, so that they will be able to teach others. They will be able to go and make disciples who are disciple makers. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He says you're going to suffer. You need to know that. You're going to suffer for the gospel. And it basically is everybody does in that in that generation. Uh, now verse 4. I got a story about verse 4. When uh, Jim Elliott was a great athlete in school. And uh, it came time for graduation. And you know the, uh, the, the school uh, albums that uh, are created at that time. Yearbooks. Yearbooks album, yearbook, uh, she was really, uh, the, this lady, Elizabeth, was really sweet on Jim, uh, Jim Elliott. And as she put her yearbook in front of him and had him to write something in there, he wrote down 2 Timothy 2.4. She looked at that and she ran back to her room to see what it said. To see what the secret message was to her about how he loved her too. Maybe. What it said was, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Not the most romantic passage ever to be shared with a girl from a guy. Now, they later got married, uh, and Jim was one of those missionaries that got killed on the shore in Ecuador by the Aka Indians. Elizabeth later went and ministered to those same Indians that killed her husband. Talk about grace. Wow. But no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. We could lay aside a bunch of junk, couldn't we? To focus on the gospel and the message that's important. 
An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. We've got to stay in our lane as far as Christians. We've got to uh, compete according to the rules. What are the rules? Love God. Love each other. Receive grace. Give grace. Even when they don't deserve. By the way, grace by definition means you're, you're being uh, kind to someone even when they don't deserve it. All right. Uh, it's a farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. As we labor, as we labor, one of the things that happens when someone comes to know Jesus from a word that we've spoken there is such a joy that comes. Uh, a lady uh, told me the other day when she was working with someone who came to know Jesus, she said, I'd almost forgotten what that was like. Uh, but it is the greatest moment in my life when that happens, when someone comes to know Jesus. Paul ends with or this verse, Think over what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. In all these things that he said, the Lord will give you understanding. We would do well this week to think over what we've heard today. What the word says to us today. All right. So we have fill in here and then we're done. Uh, with this fill in, the priesthood of the believer God's intention for humanity is what uh, is that we be a kingdom of priests, not just a kingdom with priests. His ultimate purpose is that we come to God directly through the mediating work of Jesus Christ, thus eliminating the need for another priest. We don't need a priest. We need a relationship with Jesus. And then we become a priest. The priesthood of the believer. What a concept. So, in light of this lesson, what should we do? Love God. <laughs> Love God. Share the gospel. Share grace. Share grace. Be graceful to people that don't deserve it. All right. Good, good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together in your word. And we're so grateful that we do have the freedom to do this at this point in time. Lord, we pray that you would ever, ever keep us and guide us in the sharing of your gospel. Help us to be intentional in our sharing of the gospel. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.